One moment. I only say, oh, okay, that's no good. Hmm, how do I fix this? Uh, but to uh, rescale this or something? That looks better, right? Uh, how do I break this out? Oh, it's been a while since I was on here. I can't remember how to use any of this stuff. Oh, you're not up now. Um, get this open up my laptop. Is the audio coming through okay? Obviously, if it's not, you wouldn't be able to say anything. But hopefully you can hear me. Cool. Right, so... I've done a little bit of work on this over the last couple of days and I think I know what I want to do but I need to formalise it a little bit so uh, to start with I'll just get a little Notion document together uh, I'll share this somewhere maybe and we'll keep this open just so people can drop in and out and understand what we're doing but what is the plan? The plan So that's the rough idea. You've got some Haskell source files, you change one of the source files in some kind of semantics preserving way, and that single file gets recompiled, but the rest of your project can be used from the next cache. Um, of course, if you make a change to that Haskell file that changes the types of things, everything that depends on that will also have to rebuild and so on. Um, so how are we gonna do this? So there's a couple of things. Um, let's start with what happens at the moment. At the moment, let me build a Haskell project. It has been a long time since I was on here. Good to see people again. So at the moment when you build a Haskell project, um, mix essentially 
builds this by doing gc dash dash make. gc dash make takes a list of classical source code files and compiles them all in one. Uh, process. Let's call it that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we'll unpick UC dash dash make. So each has a source code file is compiled in a separate GC process. The artifacts from the fill into the next store. Uh, we'll provide a binary that has dash dash make. X so that's the idea so um, let's see how this looks from the top so we have a docker valve file use well to mix turn that into a mix expression So that's the rough idea. So start with a cabal file, use cabal to next to turn that into a Nix expression that would build the project. So this is all normal so far. Inside that Nix expression, what's actually happening is setup.hs is going to get compiled to a setup binary. Um, and inside the Nix expression, we end up calling dot slash setup build, which in turn calls dhc dash dash make. What we want to do is hook into that bit. So that's the bit where we want to replace what's happening there. And rather than just having this single kind of GHC call, we want to break that down into GHC calls for all of the individual source code files. So the inputs to those individual GHC calls will be a single piece of source code and maybe any dependencies that are required, so HI files and things like that. Um, and at that point, Nix is already like a transparent cache for us. So if your dependencies haven't changed and your source code hasn't changed, and you've already done a Nix build on that Haskell source code file, then Nix will just reuse the output. So you won't even have to rebuild that file. So that gets us uh, quite far along this. Um, so we need one more piece of the puzzle here. Uh, um, okay, so if there are dependencies between HS files, the Nix expression tracks them. Kind of, yeah. So we're going to be producing Nix expressions. Um, so let's see. Um, let's talk about that bit. So we want to replace GHC dash dash make. Um, let's so let's say we have the following. Let's take a bit of code for example. Um, so we'll have JavaScript, get out. Uh, we get these two modules. And 
so something like that. Um, we could run. Actually, let's just make. Uh, let's kind of obvious, but clear. Do this, GC will analyze source code files for a dependency graph and file them in topological order. Filing search first. We want to take that dependency graph and turn each node into a Nix derivation essentially. This derivation knows how to compile a single source code file and takes as input all previous build outputs. Arrows in the fantasy graph and the source code itself. So that's that's kind of what we're doing. So if there are dependencies between the HS files yeah, we want to recover that dependency information and we want to turn that into inputs into a Nix derivation. Um, and if we do that, then we can just say to Nix right at the end, I want you to realize like my main.hs derivation and Nix will understand, okay, to realize main.hs into main the executable, I need to first build message.hs because main has a direct dependency on message.hs. Okay, cool. So the next derivation for main references message .o. Yeah, exactly. It actually is going to reference message .o, but also message .hi. It's not entirely interesting, but uh, every time you compile a single Haskell source code file, you get an object file and you get a Haskell interface file at least. And that basically contains the type checking information for a module, so another module can kind of reuse all that type information. So. I've played around with this a little bit so far. Um, and let's have a look at some of the new pieces of the puzzle that we're going to be using that have only just kind of been added recently. Uh, so this, I guess it's the best entry point to demonstrate this. But Nix now has a special experimental command called make content addressable. Um, we're going to be using that. Uh, I haven't actually mentioned why we'll use that. Maybe let's jump back over and talk about that. Uh, so, yeah, I said we're going to use make content addressable. So what is that? So Nix, by default, comes up with the name of every object in the next door based on essentially the source code for everything prior to it. Uh, and it's pretty much like a SHA-256 of all of that um, transitive source code. Uh, let's write that down. Next, by default, names all entries in the next door based on the transitive hash of all source code requires to eventually that relation. So this is a good model, um, but the problem is if something down the line changes in some kind of semantics preserving way, everything downstream from that dependency will also end up getting a new name, which means uh, you have to do a new build. Yeah, so it's kind of like a Merkle tree. In fact, maybe it's exactly a Merkle tree? Possibly. Um, so, yeah, the problem there is you change, I mean, let, let's, let's look at this in the context of maybe this message.hs and main.hs. Uh, usually, this is good, but let's look at this in the context of message.hs and main.hs. We want to build main, so it will have a store entry name based on the hash of main.hs, 
message dot oops message dot hs okay so we're okay there um, but this means this means whenever we change message dot hs main dot hs has to be default. There is no alternative. Whatever you do to message.hs, even if it's changing a comment, uh, changing white space, anything that doesn't change the object file will change. Will still change the hash of main.hs, which means you will have to rebuild main.hs, which is the whole problem um, that we're trying to essentially avoid here. This happens because main.hs is essentially keyed on the byte byte-wise hash, byte-based hash of message .hs. Um, But this is wrong, because main.hs doesn't really depend on message.hs. Main.hs depends on message.o and message.hi, which are artifacts of building message.hs. So we kind of want to break that dependency from main depending on the source code of message.hs to main depending on the build results of that. So uh, with content addressability, we can change the hash of a store path based on its content rather than its dependencies. So now, um, let's say, Mix store two five six. Yeah, is actually named based on so hopefully that makes sense. The idea is you Produce something in the next door, but then you essentially um, so you produce things in the next door, but then rewrite them into something else in the next door. And it's just based on the contents. So this notion of content addressability means if you know the resulting hash of something, you can look it up in the next door. You don't need to know about all the things that came along to build it. Uh, the nice property, or at least my hope here is, what we can basically do is compile message.hs, that will produce an object file, and then if we make that thing content addressable, if we've already built a version of message.hs that produced an object file with the same hash, we'll end up rewriting to the exact same next door. And now, when we build main.hs, our input will be one of those object files, and that dependency graph has already been evaluated once before. Okay, so if I add a blank line to message.hs, it doesn't change message.o or message.hi. So the hashes don't change, so main.hs still has its dependencies met and doesn't need to be recompiled. That's exactly it. So message.hs, like the build expression there, is going to depend on the final build product of an object file and a hi file. Um, so, so that's the kind of idea. So we need content addressability to get this kind of early cutoff behavior. And uh, we're going to need nix and nix because this ghc dash dash make replacement is itself going to use nix build to build things. And by default, you can't call nix build from inside a nix build, but that has changed very recently. So... Why doesn't Nix use content addressable hashes throughout? Do we give something up using content addressing over dependency addressing? It's a much more complicated model, um, mostly due to problems of non-determinism, I want to say. Um, let's see. So uh, for a good understanding, I suppose, of this, uh, let's see if we can find this ill code. So this uh, thesis, I think it's this one, um, has two chapters that discuss the two ways you could build a Nix store. So what we have in Nix at the moment is called the extensional model, which is the idea that you know your hash based on knowing everybody else's hash, or your dependencies hash. 
the content addressability model is called the intentional model. So if you built an entire Next store based on content addressability, you'll be implementing this notion of an intentional model. Um, and so this is where things get more complicated. So in normal Next with the extensional model, you can basically use direct equality to know if you've already got something previously built. Um, but under this intentional model, my understanding is I think due to non-determinism, you can have multiple different outputs of a build, but they're all you all want to treat them somewhat equivalently. So you need now rather than to take equality checks between things, you have to actually search within equivalence classes. Um, let's see if I can get into any of this. Don't want to dive too much into this because it's, I mean, it's a whole chapter in a thesis for a reason. It's kind of tricky to summarize. Well, it's not a great defense for it. Um, so here's kind of one thing. You know that these two glibcs are equivalent in some sense. Um, but when you run Firefox in this one, you end up with a kind of collision because you end up with two different glibcs. So instead, what you want to do is rewrite this. Oh, that's it, because this libidl came from somebody else that has a different glibc, essentially, but they could be treated equivalently. So you want to rewrite this libidl to depend on the same glibc as something else. So here there's two glibcs, but then it gets rewritten. So this Firefox kind of closure ends up having only one glibc. So that's not a great explanation, but hopefully it gives a bit of motivation that this stuff is actually pretty subtle and complicated to do in the entire next door, but we're not trying to do that. What we're going to do is like opt in to content addressability in a couple of small little places. And my hope and hypothesis is that we can just drop in a little bit um, in the context of this work and that will be enough and we don't need content addressability in the entire store. So make content addressable takes a store path and just gives you a new store path that's content addressable. So rewrites the hash essentially. Uh, but that breaks all of the kind of dependency information away from the build result, which is ultimately what ultimately what we want to do. Um, where are the RFCs for Nix? Because we do have something else that could come soon, which is quite interesting. So maybe people want to have a read on this. Um, so this RFC suggests adding a new attribute to uh, derivation, which is content addressed, which will essentially let you build things in the next door and then immediately rewrite them to use content addressability, which I think will simplify a lot of the stuff that we're probably gonna end up building. But I'm a little hesitant to use this prototype pull request on my system because you probably don't want to try this in an existing Nix installation since it requires a change in the database schema and there's no guarantee that it won't corrupt the store. Um, maybe at some point we'll set up a VM or something and play around with it. Um, but for now, I think we have what we need inside Nix itself. So one is make content addressable. The other one, let's see if I can find the commit that landed fairly recently, is what gives us uh, recursive Nix or the ability to call Nix build from within Nix build. Already on page two, look at that, it all goes so busy. Right, here we go. So, can I see the commits? There are some nice commit messages that I wanted to dig out for this. So I can find them. Not that one. Right. So up from there. Ah, okay, here's the pull request actually. Let's go on there. So this is pretty cool. So you can't do this normally in Nix, but we can do this now. Uh, sorry, for the name of the paper, um, you want the purely functional software deployment model, but I tend to just Google Ilco thesis PhD, uh, PDF. <laughs> Um, so there's your suitable Google juice to get to this paper. So normally you can't do this, but what's happening here is we've got a Nix expression that uses run command, which basically means I'll produce something in the Nix store by running a bash script. But the contents of this strip script is quite interesting because it actually calls Nix build itself. 
And the ergonomics of all of this are kind of messy if you're doing this purely in Nix, but we're going to be generating this stuff from Haskell. So um, it gets complicated because you're kind of writing source code in a string, and then there's all sorts of weird string escaping, and you have to be very careful that you use the right type of quotes and stuff. In this case, I think it comes out okay. But even then, like you're in a string here, and then you're in a string here, and then you want to produce a string here, and like you're kind of limited to the types of quotation marks you can use, which is kind of annoying. But what's happening here is inside this foo derivation thing, we're going to rebuild hello and just rename it and call, use Nix build to do that. And when you actually realize all of this, when you realize the outer derivation, you'll see inside it will actually start building um, hello again inside a nested Nix build um, process. And the reason is this is kind of close to import from derivation, but it's, I think, a little bit nicer because it's all happening at build time, which is what you're ultimately interested in. Um, and in this case, it's not very interesting, but what it basically gives you is some ability to kind of be dynamic inside a Nix build. So normally in a Nix build, you have to be very static about all of your dependencies. You have to know upfront exactly what you want. So in the context of this, if we wanted to build main.hs in the normal Nix sense, we would have to know kind of a priori that main depends on message.hs, which is essentially duplicating the structure of your program, which sucks. So instead, what we want to do is run a Nix build that's given a directory tree or maybe an input, like a, a target file, which is the main thing to build, and then use GHC itself to work out what is the dependency structure. So at build time, essentially produce more build steps. Um, and seeing as we're doing Haskell, I'm going to guess people are familiar with some basic Haskell stuff. This is basically moving from a kind of applicative build system where you have to know everything statically to a monadic build system where one build step can produce more build steps. So uh, let me see, where can I stick this? Let's see if I can share this. Uh, it's public. Uh, copy page link. Let's see if I can just pop this into Twitch somehow. I do it here. I want it in there. Oh, well, let's drop it in here. You guys could tell me if you could see that because we're going to jump into some code now, and this is kind of going to be a useful document to just point people out if they join the stream and they wonder what on earth's going on. Um, let me just quickly hide everything a moment. I'm just going to get set up with Nix. So we're going to have to run a fork of Nix. And I just want to see if I can get set up to do that without disclosing a bunch of passwords or something like that by accident. But uh, I think this is OK. I don't think you guys would see anything too interesting here. So let's try this. Uh, So inside my configuration.nix, I have the option to go into the nix attribute and replace the package that um, is essentially the, the nix that I want to run. Because I want to run basically head, because um, I need some bleeding edge features to do this. So let's get this commit. That char is wrong. I'm just going to hide this once more because I have no idea what's in my terminal at the moment. Okay. So, this is the least professional stream ever, so thank you for putting up with the random alt tabs and me hiding things, but mostly just want people to hang out and see this and we'll see what we get. So I've updated the revision here. Um, I should be able to run Nixos rebuild switch. Failed to type my password in. Uh, cool. So this is going to build me a new version of Nix. Of course that char is wrong. I thought we knew that. So let's get the new one. 
So downside of Monadic would be that you can't statically analyze the process. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. So I guess for something like Lori, if you're familiar with that, um, which wants to know what files make up your like next shell or something like that, the moment you're Monadic, Lori probably wouldn't be able to follow all of that dependency information. They would only kind of see the outermost one, which might be a problem. I'm not entirely sure, but it could be a problem. Um, but again, what we're doing here is just kind of exploring this this part of the design space, as Ed Komet likes to call these things, and just seeing, you know, like, is this actually like viable? Is it useful? Can we do it? Um, so while Nix builds, I'm going to just sketch out some stuff in Nix expressions, and we'll start with what is essentially a kind of pure Nix prototype where I am going to do things by hand, just so you can get a feel of uh, how this type of system looks, and then we might look at trying to write this ghc dash dash make replacement. Um, half five at the moment. I'm hoping to go till about seven o'clock, so we've got about an hour and a half, so hopefully we can get something interesting done in that time. So, um, Uh, what are we going to call this? Incremental Haskell. Let's start with something here. I'm going to need uh, go one more. Just going to set up a little that basic example Haskell project. Um, so we have something to work with. Let's go in here. Right. Okay, so this is like the example project that I want to add an incremental build system to. So let's just extend that a little bit with message.hs. I suppose what might be interesting here is just to show you that GHC dash dash make thing, or to show you what Cabal is doing under the hood that we want to kind of tap into. If we run Cabal build with dash V, um, we can see here, here, there's that GHC dash dash make. We get passed in a whole load of stuff that's not particularly interesting, but right at the end, we can see there's that dot slash main HS. Um, if we actually change that ever so slightly and make Cabal slightly more happy, you should be able to add in a message as another module. Now if I do dash V, uh, where's that make? There it is. Yeah, now you can see it's also asking for message and main.hs. And so this all happens in a single um, process, like single exec core. And that's the bit that we're going to try and break out. Uh, or at least break that open to be more separate GHC calls and to use Nix and stuff. Um, Cabal then also does like a link phase separately and we'll probably maybe try and do the same thing. It's also using GHC dash dash make. So basically we want to impersonate GHC dash dash make and figure out what we need to do based on what we're given. Um, this one's kind of interesting actually. I've never really seen this. Like it's still get given the source code, but the only thing that's different here is this no link thing gets toggled. Okay, we'll get to that later. So, we've got our little Haskell project. We're building this with Cabal, which is not what we're interested in. What we'd like to do is build this with Nix. Uh, how are we getting on here? Okay, so we have a version of Nix that should have
that looks good, I guess. It's not telling me that, yeah. So we've got the make content addressable command. Let's now look at building this in Nix. And we'll just do this by hand for now. Um, so what are we going to need? Uh, let's get some packages. derivation type thing. Hmm, actually, you know what, let's use run command. Just a little bit simpler, less kind of magic going on behind the scenes. So, what do we do to do this? We are going to need some source code. We're going to need GHC. Mm -hmm. So this is a good start. That basically means it's doing this run command thing. And whenever you use run command, you have to produce the output. Um, but our bash script here is not doing anything at all. So we didn't produce an output. So we need to change this to actually produce that output. So that's not too hard. Um, let's see, where are we at the moment? Have we actually got a... We're in slash build. That should probably be okay, I guess. Um, we should be able to GHC dash dash make uh, source slash message.hs and source main.hs and produce out. Right. Uh, nope. Not happy with that. What if I... I think the problem there is it's trying to write this .o file into the next store, which it's not going to be allowed to do. So let's see if I can just... Uh, now it's trying to put the hi file there, so let's tell it to put hi files in this directory as well. There we go. So, like, that's uh, hello, welcome. Sorry, I am looking at chat. Uh, so that's like a super minimal way to use Nix to build um, a Haskell project. Uh, but there's no increment in incrementalization here. So we'll get a feel for that. I'll just go back into that test project now. Let's open up the message. Like, if I rebuild this now, it doesn't do anything at all, which is great. If I had a new line here, it's recompiled message and it's recompiled main. But that's nonsense, because I know that the object file here, message.o, hasn't changed. Um, let's see if I can show you that. Uh, at least <laughs> that's my kind of everything hinges on this being stable so hopefully I'm correct there so there, there it is D902 and if I take that new line or let's put another new line in D902 so we got exactly the same thing and of course if I do change the message then it rebuilds as we would expect and in this case, I would expect main to be rebuilt because this thing has actually changed. So that's um, this build expression is not sufficient. Um, so let's, we can break this up a little bit. So we, uh, the first thing that I know is GHC dash dash make is actually the wrong thing here because that's too powerful. We need to break this apart into a more traditional kind of make farly approach and do separate compilation. So GHC supports that quite easily. Uh, you just do we'll build message.hs we'll build main.hs and then we will link maybe we can mm, yeah okay well then you typically link with so if I got that right. Hmm. 
have a feeling when you use dash C you don't actually get any nice output, which is a little bit of a shame. Yeah, it doesn't actually tell you what it's compiling, which kind of sucks, but it did build something new. But again, we've got the same problem here. New lines go away. Um, dash V show it? Well, dash V is far too much. Let's not do that. Uh, hmm. I guess you can kind of see that. It doesn't entirely help, but you can see that it definitely called GOT for message.hs and main.hs. Um, so this is still no good, because we're, you know, as we've seen, random white space, everything gets rebuilt. So, enough setting the stage. Let's look at how we could fix that. So what we're going to do is instead of calling GHC here, we want to call next build from within this. As I said, by default, you're not going to be allowed to do that. Um, let's go down here, and this is file message. So, how do we compile message.hs? In this case, I'm interested in the .o file and the .hi file, so my output is going to be a directory. Uh, I need run command, which is going to come from some version of mix packages. I'm going to need C as a build input, and I'm going to call gc-c message.hs Oda out hider out. Uh, right, and then where's it going to get message.hs from? So if we can supply that here as an argument. Something like that. Um, yeah, let's take a break in this part, and now I won't show you Nix and Nix just yet, but we're almost ready to look at that. So, um, So, right, the problem there is basically uh, when we try to compile main.hs, um, it needs to know about the message module. Because remember, main is importing message. But the uh, .hi file and the .o file are no longer in the same directory that we're doing our build in. So I need to pass in dash i with the artifacts that are produced from compiling message.hs. Think, yep. Okay, so let's just have a look at this a second. Can I do that? Uh, that's a bit more than I wanted, I guess. Yeah, I guess you can kind of see it. Like to build the test project, 
we have to compile message.hs, which... Mm, let's, have, let's have a look at this. So here's a derivation. Actually, we'll use show derivation. Oh, really? So we get a JSON. Oh, I don't have JK installed. A JSON look at a derivation. Here's what it should produce as an output. Let's have a look at that. So there you can see is the hi file and the .o file, just for message. Um, I guess we could do the same for main. Obviously there's some duplication going on here, which is not very nice, but we will look at tidying that up soon. But to compile main, we actually need a dependency to be passed in as well. So we'll pass a message there. And now the only thing we need to do here is our kind of linking stage. So now you can see that in order to build this whole project, we had to compile main.hs to something, and we had to build our whole test project as the top level thing. But we didn't compile message.hs, and that's because we've already done that previously, and nothing has changed. And now we see, it, like, let's, to really hammer this home, the problems of this setup, which looks very nice, and it's like every file is an individual Nix build expression, and that seems quite good. The moment you introduce just some arbitrary white space, now when we do our build, we have to compile message.hs and main.hs, which again, we know is nonsense, because main, again, there's no reason that you would have to recompile that. So, Maybe at this point we can use the content addressable stuff. Yeah, let's try it. Let's try that. Um, because the problem that we've identified basically is, uh, let's see, so in this one, cat it. There's the derivation for compiling message. So ZW0, JZ. But in this one, it's a different one. 6 I W M D. Um, but if we look at both of these, let's see if I can find the outputs of these. Um, uh, where's that derivation gone? It should be, I guess I can just diff them. So that's six IW on that one. Oh no, I want the outputs, don't I? So there's one output. Search. Yeah. And there's another output, but if we diff these. Ooh, okay, the HI files differ. Is potentially a problem. Why are they different? Ugh. You also have this problem with Cabal and Stack, right? Problem with right. You do? Well, kind of. So. No, actually you don't. Um, the reason you don't have this problem with Cabal is Cabal is just doing this ghc dash dash make thing, which I probably should have demonstrated that it doesn't have this problem. So, or at least I'm pretty sure it doesn't. So there it compiled message and it compiled make. It might do it because these interface files are changing. No, okay, so it didn't. So there it compiled 
message and main because they've both changed, but then the next time I just changed a little bit of white space, it only compiled message and it did linking again. So other build systems don't have this problem. And that's, of course, exactly what you want from something like Cabell. And that's because it understands that the object file hasn't changed. Um, the reason that happens, I think, is because of how GHC dash dash make works. And it... I don't think it's hashing anything, but I think it's not updating a file if it can see that it's unchanged. I'm not entirely clear what's happening there, but it's... Probably based on timestamps as well, would be my guess. So these are all 1744. Uh, must be slightly cleverer than that then, maybe. But either way, I don't really know how it works, but it's clearly doing the, a minimal rebuild there, which is what we want. Yeah, so even then, like it's 1745 now, none of these have changed other than the message that I want. Wait, which again is not the one that... Oh no, I would ex possibly expect that to change. Not sure. I'm not going to get out too far down that rabbit hole, but... However it's doing it, it's probably somewhat hard-coded for Cabell. If the dot .o changes, but its symbols do not, you could also skip linking directly. Um, yeah, you could, but I'm not sure how you... Is there a way to figure that out? You kind of want to fingerprint an object file, I guess is what you're saying. And if those those fingerprints are stable, then you're you're okay. Um, ultimately, I would have thought if anything in an object file changes, as in it doesn't have an identical like MD5 or SHA hash, then you should definitely relink. That's probably a good assumption to to have. Um, but if we link with gold or something like that, linking is pretty cheap. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we're doing um, may just be like shuffling code around and stuff. So at least we get some fast builds there. So let's try and recover that early cut off stuff here. So when we did our linking phase up here, we used main.o and message.o. What we really want to do is make those content addressable. So I should now be able to do nix experimental features, nix command, make content addressable. So what I'm thinking right now is we actually need the content addressability up here. Can we do this won't work though now? Hmm. Well, let's just see what this does for now, just to get an idea of what this content addressability thing is all about. Nix command not found. Not a problem. Hmm. Actually, yeah, you know what? Uh, no, no, I'm not going to get down that road hole now. This might, I think I might know what the problem is here. I think we're going to need the same nix I have for my desktop, so this special overridden one. Let's try that. Oh. Okay, so this is already part of the problem. Um, so creating directory nix slash var doesn't work because what's actually happening is inside this build, maybe I should do that. 
I think there shouldn't even be a slash nix directory. Yeah, there is. Oh, there is. What's in there? Store. So we're in this sandbox environment that only has access to things in the nix store, but it doesn't actually have like a full nix store. So that's where recursive nix comes in. So let's see if we can turn that on. And this should let us call this make content addressable command. Um, so how to do, whoa, wrong button. How do we do this? So unfortunately, a lot of this stuff is not really documented, but there is kind of some documentation um, in the commit messages. find one of those um, so we need to do, 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 do. No, there's more that you have to do than that. Um, enable recursive next using a feature. So we have to set that. This may... Okay, so now it says I don't know where I could build a derivation that needs recursive next. But that's fine. Um, because we just have to enable that. So, somewhere in the setting here, nix.system features. What does this system support? It supports recursive nix and nix. Should be pretty quick to rebuild. Recursive Nix is disabled. Okay, so I need to add that experimental features thing. Uh, let me just switch over to my laptop where I have them before. Okay, if we do it in extra options. So here's the interesting thing, right? So now it rewrote this next store path to this one, which should be stable under white space changes. Let's see if that's actually true. So now we should end up building another one of those. So now we rewrote 9CV to 1IV, which is still something different. Interesting. Well, that's not going to be any good. Um, oops. Why are these interface files being different? Hmm. Oh, there's a 
way to do this. If anybody knows how to show an interface file, please shout. Um, let's click Google. Show iFace, of course. So that's one of them. What's the other one? guess it's oh this is interesting so it must be hashing <laughs> the command line options but there's a problem because if we actually look at those command line options we end up putting a nix hash in them course now the command line hash is dependent on the source code hash which is super weird right so like again pop a random white space in we'll just keep an eye on this ghc dash c call so now it's ghc dash c with a different argument which is correct because they're different files so they should be different entries in the next store but we don't want that flag hash to change um, that should actually be pretty easy to fix by just seeding into that directory. Because we shouldn't be producing files in the current directory because we're using uh, ODA and HIDA. Um, this directory is also read-only as well. Also, the ODA... Oh, that's a good point, though. The ODA and HIDA flags are now different. Good observation. So we're going to have to make those as well. So in that case, why don't we make... Uh, something like that. Spelling is awful. So let's go into that. So this is all stable now. This is a completely static string, which is what we want. And then we just move the old results to out. And we're going to make that directory. Mm, Message.hs does not exist because I deleted the CD by accident. Permission denied. Where is that? Did I... What? Why are you trying to make it? Oh, because we CD'd. Okay. Uh, do that. Artifact is UK. Artifact is. There we go. Well, that doesn't help anybody who's listening to the Twitch stream, but somebody has helped me understand my spelling woes in chat. Thank you for that. Can't move build results. Yep, we know why that is. Okay, now let's see if we can finally get these things to be stable. So there was our hash for message.hs. Let's put in more white space. So we rewrote 54kw to sbfzz. We've now rewritten 04jmb to sbfzz. So those now we can see, 
when I say we can see. SV, it's that, and it's that, and they're exactly the same thing. So that's really cool. So now we have managed to produce an entry in the next door that is invariant up to white space changes and things like that in the Haskell source code. The problem is the we still don't have full incrementalization everywhere because like this rewriting here is happening over here. Uh, but the results of message are going into main. And basically what the problem is, is we can't really build main until we build message because we don't know what the result of building message is. So this is where we need that kind of monadic build process. We need to only come up with the next derivation to build main once we've built message. But we have nix and nix now, so we can build nix expressions at build time, which should give us what we need. So let's see if we can move some of this stuff um, into our actual main nix build script, I suppose. Take those guys out. And this is where it's going to start getting pretty horrible, and bash is going to feel pretty painful here. But we're pretty close to having like demonstrated the whole fundamental approach that we want to do, and then it's just a case of writing some Haskell to tidy this up. So we need to call this thing inside a Nix build. We can do that with Nix build and pass it a Nix expression to build. Um, we can put that in a variable. Um, is this all correct? So this needs to be a this is actually oops so there it is. Um, this is actually a, a like we want Nix to interpolate a true file path here so I'm going to go into Nix to do that and this is also something that we want to put into the Nix store we can do that we do the same thing over here Pass in message here. No, sp oh, cool. No space around equal signs, of course. Thanks, Bash. Thank you for spotting that. So this message thing here is actually a Nix expression itself. Previously, we were using a variable, um, but what we really want to use is we want to bring this Bash variable in. So. Um, Exit single quotes and interpolate that bash variable. Let's see where that gets us. Find yes, because we haven't got to that either. We'll come back to this in a moment. So now we're building this, and the first thing it tries to do is call Nix build itself. Um, so it, what's happening here is to get true reproducible builds, Nix in Nix doesn't pass uh, environment variables down. Um, but we're calling compile message.hs.nix, and the first thing that's doing is trying to import Nix packages, but that doesn't exist. But we can fix that uh, probably most easily by exporting the Nix path. In okay, so that's not entirely true. So our outer build, yeah, let's see if this is right. Our outer build doesn't have a Nix path environment variable, I think. I have an X path. 
but inside here I do not have an XPath, right? But we can we can export an XPath into that build expression by just doing nixpath equals pkgs.path. pkgs came from this import statement up here, and dot path lets you recover the path to that nix packages environment. Of course, this isn't ideal because if you've applied overrides and things like that, that won't get passed through. Okay, this didn't actually work anyway. Uh, why didn't that work? Because I didn't save the file. So what's happened now? So these derivations will be built. So that's our outer nix build call. Then we call nix build from within that, which will then build this one. And that's uh, here we can see that build happening. We can't CD into test project though. Why is that? That's kind of strange. So we pass that into our expression. Hmm. That's a puzzle. How long have I been using Nix? Um, probably six years or so, something like that. I think I've been maybe maybe even more than that. Um, so is it private to the outer Nix? I mean, it seems to be the case that it is. And I'm not sure why. Uh, ah, okay, here's the problem. So this is exactly what I meant about how horrible it is to write Nix inside Nix, inside Bash, inside Nix. Like, it just gets messy. What I've ended up doing here is this is a Nix expression, and I've quoted them as if they were Bash arguments, but they're not. So I actually don't want the quotation marks here. And the problem is, basically what I was doing is Nix build Bash E import. And when you do that, Nix won't add something into the Nix store, but that's what we need. However, if we do this, then a file path is an actual Nix expression that will cause that file path to get copied into the Nix store, which is doubly confusing here because the file path we're working with is something in the Nix store. Yeah, here be dragons for sure. I mean, you can kind of see this, uh, yeah, from these quotes here. Like, uh, because we're using set bash x, all of that quotation stuff for bash. No, oh, actually, you do still see it here, I guess. Yeah, um, but I can kind of see this and know that uh, it's just familiarity, I suppose. I know that there shouldn't be quotation marks or any of these things. So, uh, what did that do? That then says these derivations will be built, which is our project which called Nix build to build message.hs, which has successfully built that. And then it's gone later on to build uh, main.hs. And you can see, let's see if we can see here. So it's compiling, it's using this Nix expression to compile this source code with this store output, AQ718. Now AQ718 should be the result of that in a Nix call. But remember, what we want to do is actually make that invariant to those source code changes. So we're going to use a content, content addressability there to rewrite that into a content addressable path. So um, this is message ridge. Now we can have message CA, um, which is going to be a call like this. So we're going to call make content addressable. We're going to give it a bash argument. So we do want to quote it, even though there's probably not spaces, but you know who knows. Um, which should interpolate the bash variable message or ridge. What does that do? So now we didn't end up rebuilding message.hs, which is awesome because it hasn't changed. There's that Nix build call and nothing happens, which is already amazing. 
Um, message Ridge gets set to that AQ718 thing again. AQ718 can get rewritten to SBFZZ, which we've seen before, but our variable is empty. Now, the reason I wanted to use head and haven't been able to do the stream before is because there is now a special JSON flag. So message CA is now some JSON and I, oh, fucking hell, this is annoying. So now I need to use JQ to find message a ridge in rewrites. Yeah, I think that. Quote that again. Uh, hash variable, not a Nix variable. Do I need to quote that as well? Yes, but I need the raw output from that. No, it's not called raw. So it doesn't have dash dash raw, but they call it raw. Thanks, guys. Hey, what? Didn't I just see raw? Oh, raw file. Uh, Next build CA is now SBFZZ. So now um, we just do the same thing again, but with main. And you can see we are we are well into prototyping territory at this point. Um, so much so that I need more screen space. So main is a call to compile main.hs.mix using test project, but it also needs the message results. So we will pass that in by interpolating a bash variable, which is message CA. So that's the content addressable version of messages build results. That gives us something that's not content addressed. So then we make that content addressable What does this do? So, to build the test project, we built message.hs and we got that as a result. We then immediately used make content addressable to turn this store path, nope, sorry, uh, this store path into something that's content addressable, which we get here. We then do exactly the same thing for main.hs. So here we're compiling, there's our expression to compile main.hs. There's all of our source code. There is the content addressable version of message. Um, that hasn't produced any output, but I can only assume, yeah, we didn't do set dash x, but we're gonna have to do the same thing we did for message in this file. So. There. Okay, so we had to muck the slash build slash build results. We cd into the source root. We compile main.hs, but we need to search the paths of message as well. Then we move the build results out. So let's do that. So now I think everything's going to rebuild because we changed the bash expression to build message because we put this plus x in that we probably shouldn't have that before. So there's main origin 
which seems to have compiled successfully. We then make D2AA content addressable. There it is. That produced this, ZSNK, and then we didn't produce an output. So now we just need to link. And we can link with uh, GHC. What did we do before? Did we do dash make? No, no, we didn't do dash make before. So main CA main dot O message CA message dot O into eight. So now again, you can see we didn't actually rebuild message or main at all this time. The only thing we did was linking. And if we got this right, our binary still works. And now let's have a look and see if any of this has actually paid off. So let's go ahead and just change, well, let's tidy this Haskell up. This is horrible. Um, if we change that message, and we shouldn't get an incremental build at all because changing the message should cause, I guess it shouldn't really cause Maybe it won't even cause main.hs to rebuild because it might only be in the object file. But let's have a look. What happens if we do this? Yeah, okay, so I can at least see we definitely compiled message.hs and we definitely compiled main.hs as well. So that would have happened presumably because the object file has changed. So what do we have before? Hmm, this next store name is kind of interesting. But anyway, okay, so do that. And now if we've got this right, just adding a space there. What's that gonna do? Okay, this is no good. So I think what the problem is here is this where is it? This doesn't look good because we've got two hashes in here and the this hash is itself a hash of this hash, if that makes sense. So basically I don't want to ever see two hashes here because it means we've probably introduced a little bit too much of a dependency. So what's going on there? Probably the problem is This next build call is given this, which is getting re-added to the next store. And it's doing that with um, this hash as a name. So I think if we copy this out locally, we can then add it and remove this hash entirely from it. This editor is Doom Emacs. So if you search for Doom Emacs, like the video game Doom, you should find it. And it's pretty much just the out of the box configuration. So message ridge, let's try putting this into message. What does that do? Uh, I put link. Definitely something like this. Oh, outlink, I think. Right, so what did this do? Well, it seems to have avoided building anything, which is interesting. Message CA is still that. Mm -mm -mm. That's not what I want, though, is it? It's no okay, so that outlink is not what it is. What we need to do is Whoa, that was too much. Okay, so now when we compile main.hs, 
This is a slightly different path to what we got from content addressability, but I think it may now be stable. What do we get? No. Why is this different? 1F2. 1F2. That is the same. So why are you trying to build it again? All right. I think I'm going to take a quick break here. I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. And then we'll try and unpick what the hell's going on here. So... I'll just be really professional and do this on the fly. All right, so I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Shouldn't be too long, and then we'll see if we can work out what's going on there. Okay, where were we then? So this derivation we think shouldn't have happened. So Gabriel Gonzalez wrote us a very nice little program called NixDiff that lets us diff derivations to understand why they're different. That might be useful here. So these are both trying to compile main, but they're very slightly different. So the, okay. Hmm. So this kind of makes sense. Oops, that doesn't make sense. When we try to compile main.hs, we passed in the entire source code directory, which is far too big. That's not what main.hs actually needs. main.hs is just main.hs. So, how are we going to work around that? I think our sync can sync a single file but keep its directory structure, which is kind of what we need to do here. So, if anybody has any other suggestions of alternatives here, this could be interesting to kind of spitball on. Um, what is, does this work? Ah. So the reason I'm doing this is 
Oops. We should now end up with hmm, a directory called source that contains only main.hs and not message.hs. I have no idea where this error is coming in though. Uh, oh. Yep, yeah, okay. Need to have arsync. So if we list the source directory, there's nothing in it at all. Is that what that's saying? Yeah. Ah, I guess when I did that arsync on a file, it tried to put it there. So let me turn that into a directory first. Hello, Pharaoh. So now, if we list the source directory, it only has main.hs, which is good. We don't need that here. So let's clean that up. Shouldn't need to force that. But most importantly, that GHC call now only contains a single hash. Does that stuff still matter? Maybe not. We'll try in a second. Okay. Uh, so now we put some white space in. And there we go. We got incrementalization. Finally. If I take all of the oh, excuse me. If we take all of these set things out now. Get rid of that LS. Uh, like what? Quiet or something? Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, Nix is a little chatty, but I don't think that really matters. Uh, so. If we change the string, we rebuild message and we re rebuild main. Yes, that's as expected. The result has changed, but if we change just the white space, we compiled just message and we relinked and we still got the same message, which is exactly what we'd expect. Um, I tr yeah, so that's, that's the, the basic idea of what we want to do. Uh, so there's one thing I want to try is, do we really need to do this? Kind of nice if we could do that. That recompiled main, but I think I'm expecting that because it's inputs change. Um, what about that? Yeah, okay, so that's that preserves incrementaliness. Um, so I didn't need to copy that one out as well, so we're at least avoiding some extra IO there that we don't need to do. And I suppose also just to prove that we get the kind of idempotent build behavior that we got before. If I just do an next build and nothing changed, then we get exactly the same thing, which is pretty cool. Um, of course, what we're left with is uh, 
not particularly elegant in any sense. Like we had to write these compile message Nix expressions. It'd be nice if we could have just one of those. So I think we could unify these. So let's just have a look at doing that. So let's call that compile hs. So this takes a source root. I think you do need to remove source between compiles. Um, well, so every time we do a Nix build, we'll get a brand new directory structure and we'll enter a chroot jail and stuff like that. So the only reason we're doing an RM here is if we were going to do this again, I don't want to end up accidentally reusing the same source directory and accidentally send too many source code files over. Uh, so what do you mean by the, so you mean, maybe we're saying the same thing, like we've got some kind of like main 2.hs thing. Is that what you're saying? Because yes, in that case, you definitely do want an rm-r source, otherwise you'd end up sending main 2.hs into the same source directory, yeah. So yeah, we're saying the same thing there. Um, this kind of sucks that we have to do this, but oh, that's not the end of the world. So my ultimate plan with a lot of this as well is um, ideally you say like libnix to link nix into a Haskell executable and not even have to do all of these like nix command line calls. It would be nice to lose all of the exec overhead, but I'm not sure if Libnix actually exposes all of this stuff right now. That's a, that's going to be a long way down the line. We're not going to get to that today. Um, right, so we were going to tidy up this compile HS thing. So it takes a source root and it takes a list of dependencies. I don't really know what that's going to be called. Uh, so what are we going to do here? We need to... So there is a useful function here. Basically what I want to do, so dependencies is going to be a list of directories and we need to do dash i on each of those. So we have depend so kind of essentially like dependencies zero. This is not Nix, but you know, you know, hopefully you can understand what I'm getting at. We want to do something like that. So Nix being a little programming language, oh, I don't have it here, does come with a useful standard library. And I think there's a function, uh, yeah, like a helper function. That's exactly what we need, which is concat map strings sep. Map a function over a list of strings, concatenate the results with a specified separator interspersed between elements. So it takes a list of strings, a separator string, a function to transform strings, and gives you back a final string. So concat map strings sep. in lib need our separator our formatting function and our list of dependencies I think that's right and now I should be able to compile or to compile hs Nothing there. This can be compile HS with a list. It's not always main.hs. Um, the we'll have one more in for now. We could probably infer that from the directory structure, but. Uh, 
Okay, this one is main.hs. That seemed to work. So that's at least well questionable if that's really tidied anything up, but I think it has. Um, um, what else do we need to do? Oh yeah, so there's yeah. This is kind of related to that whole thing we were talking about before of whether we need to remove the source directory. We're not really being correct about how we compile message.hs. So if I change main.hs in any particular way, message.hs depends on the whole project. We're going to have the same problem, which sucks. So we change main, and uh, you can't actually really see what it's compiling which is unfortunate. <laughs> but it compiled two Haskell things and we wouldn't expect that. So again, we can do the same thing here. But rather than putting main.hs now, we're gonna just send a message.hs in. And that didn't need to do anything, I guess, because we just got to cache it right off the top, um, which is pretty cool. So, I might actually wrap this up here. Um, I think this is a good stopping point. That is essentially the idea. Um, what comes next is generating this, essentially, from Haskell. So, um, GHC has kind of got support for this already. So one thing you can do is use dash m with main.hs. I have no idea what this dep suffix thing is, is about. Um, but if you do gxc dash capital M, it produces a make file which kind of shows you all of these dependencies. So gxc is perfectly capable of analyzing a single file and producing a dependency tree. So there is like the graph. So one, one idea I do have, or maybe this is an option, which I'm probably not going to take now, but we could do in the future, is you could you could take a make file and have Nix build that whole make file. So we could literally have something that you give Nix a directory containing a make file, and Nix, right off the top, gives you incrementalization on anything that uses a make file, which is pretty crazy and pretty cool. So maybe we'll do that at some point. Um, Actually, what is, what is the time? Maybe we go. I have put a little bit of this together already, so you know what? Why don't we? Uh, I'll, I'll type out what I've already typed to my laptop once, just so we've got something there as well. Um, basically, I want to try and recover this output, but using the GHC API, because once we've got this, we can then analyze this graph and turn it into Nix derivations and all sorts of cool stuff like that, which is really the bulk of the work. Um. Uh, let's call this GHC Nix. So I'm going to be lazy because I have prepared this once before in the past. So I'm just going to find it on here and I'll just type out what it's doing. It's literally, what is this, 90 lines of code? So we should be pretty good here. So. Um, Going to build something. Uh, yeah. Whenever you're using the GHC API, um, there's this GHC monad, which is basically where all the interesting stuff happens. Um, let's see if I can show you this. So run GHC takes a GHC A and gives you an IOA. But the most important thing is this maybe file path. 
you can see the argument to init GHC monad, but it doesn't really tell you much. But what it does tell you is that you should use the GHC paths library. So the first argument should point to the, di the directory where GHC's library files reside. More precisely, this should be the output of GHC dash dash print libdir. For portability, you should use the GHC pass package, which is exactly what we're going to do. So libdir comes from ghc.paths. Um, I suppose just showing you that. ghc.paths literally just gives you this magic thing that I think at compile time it figures out exactly what the contents of that should be. And I think Nix has a like patched version of this. So we're going to run ghc. We're going to get args. Let's see, did that actually work? with GHC paths we are then just going <laughs> to kind of feels amusing that after writing a whole GHC make file build system thing we're now just using GHC dash dash make again but oh well uh, package with GHC so we've got access to that So that is just parsing command line arguments. We so the idea is to intercept this GHC dash dash make thing. So what we can actually do is use the GHC API to parse a list of command line arguments. So we can basically act as if we were GHC, but we can do obviously all sorts of different things with the result of that. Command line arguments in GHC are called Dyn flags, dynamic flags. I guess that stands for. Um, but you'll never see it fully spelt out because nothing in the GHC API is a full word. So we can pass some dyne flags and get some leftover argument, which is going to be filed by we get our initial dyne flags. And then we can get some new dyne flags, some leftovers. Oh, I don't know what this is. So now I can do something like, uh, I could use these exact same arguments. That wasn't interesting. Uh, I don't think I can print dying flags, which kind of sucks. So nothing in the GHC API tends to have a show instance as well, which really makes things a lot of fun. Um, oh, for God's sake. Okay, I can't show you much on that. I'm not going to mess around too much with that. But we have some flags, which we can then enable. So if I do this, this is a program that doesn't do anything particularly interesting. I guess maybe uh, oh, doesn't even do any like error checking. But what we're gonna do is, I'm ultimately interested in running. Uh, actually, no. You know what? I'm interested in test project. I'm interested in that. Maybe if 
I want to get the dependency graph of main.hs, basically. Let's see if we can do something with that. So I need to set some targets. So for each of these files, I get a something that's located. And I just want to discard that located stuff. Located just means it's associated with a line number. But that's kind of weird here because the command line arguments don't come from a file. I think this is so you, you know, like this function can support the options pragma that we could put on like line two here. And so for each file, I'm going to return a target which has an ID, which is a file. I don't know what this means, but I seem to need it on. Probably template Haskell stuff, but we're not actually compiling anything, so I don't think it really matters. Um, do that. That again, yeah, just immediately crashes, which is not interesting. So, um, this is going to get interesting to say out loud. I need to dep anal, I don't know, dependency analysis. Just just write that down, GHC devs. Stop making me look like an idiot when I try and say things. Um, but if we do this, it's going to do dependency analysis on all of the targets that I've specified. And the targets came from uh, files, which came from parsing the command line arguments, which basically means this command line invocation has some flags, but it also has some files, and that's going to be our target. So in this case, we have one target, but if we do dependency analysis on this, we should f discover the dependency on message.hs. That's the, that's the plan. So we do, we get our module graph from that. I then get get a HSCN, which I need for some reason. I also need to get my targets again. Seems a bit weird. Uh, I printed this for some reason in the past, so let's maybe keep that length targets. So I got one target, which is what I'd expect. And I guess if I put a message here, I get two targets, but we'll stick with one. Um, so now that I've got targets, I can get some strongly connected components. The standard graph algorithm, which comes from topologically sorting the module graph. Don't know what false is. Don't know what nothing is. But apparently you need them. That gives me a list. So my one went to two, which seems good. I guess it's discovered message. And now we can just have a look and see what we discovered. So, um, for loop over each of these we want a cyclic strongly connected components we shouldn't ever have a, a, a loop in this graph it's going to give us a mod summary location file and some ms oops Okay, where does a click SCC come from? Uh, I think finder. No. 
Vibrat. MLHS files, is that correct? Or did I typo that? Should be MLHS file. Lambda case is just the best. I do love it as well. But I only love it more when I've got block arguments. I love this guy. How nice is that? We have dollars all over the place before. Much nicer. Um, uh, that's not good. Let's actually give it some information. So there we go. So if I, that, it's not hard to use the GHC API to get some type of dependency information. Whether or not this is in a shape that's suitable for us to actually do anything with, I'm not entirely sure. But I'm already kind of in, interested in the fact that I gave it main.hs and it's like message.hs has appeared out of nowhere. So that's probably where we'll wrap up now. Um, this seems like a good stopping point. We've got, uh, I suppose, yeah, to recap. Um, maybe I'll try and put this on GitHub or something. Um, we've got this little prototypey thing which seems to work to get us incremental builds and requires bleeding edge Nix features, but they're all in master at least now. And now we're interested in tidying this thing up because our goal to recap my little design document is we want to replace the GHC dash dash make and that's what we're working on at the moment. And to recap on our progress there, we have something that kind of spits out dependency information, but it's not turning this into Nix derivations. So I don't think it's much work. Like it feels like maybe a couple more hours to, to, to build this, to turn this Haskell thing into something that produces um, Nix derivations or like calls Nix commands and things like that. So maybe we'll pick that up. I'm not sure when I will next get a chance to do that. Um, but hopefully in the next couple of weeks, like we'd like to get this done pretty soon so thanks for thanks for joining me everyone i hope you have a lovely christmas if i don't see you before then and a happy new year and all of that if you're celebrating that kind of stuff i'll drop some links into twitter um my github account is what is my github account oh charles i guess yeah so it'll appear on here so if you're interested i'll try and stick that whole directory up um and have a play but yeah see ya